As COVID-19 progressively shut down the global tourist industry from March this year, one of the businesses that was hit hard was Dunedin Railways Limited. Formerly known as Tauri Gorge Railway, this is an iconic tourist attraction in the Lower South Island. Originally set up by volunteer railway enthusiasts who raised money by public subscription, the operation had become more professionalised and in recent years the business had been rebranded as Dunedin Railways. Its target market has shifted from domestic tourists to largely international visitors, many of whom arrived in Port Chalmers via cruise ships and went on chartered excursions that were lucrative for the company. The REMTU has had collective agreement with Dunedin Railways and its predecessor company for a long time. For years there were two shareholders, a trust and Dunedin City Holdings Limited, DCHL, Dunedin City Council's investment arm. It never made a great deal of money, but the strategy was always to break even and attract tourists to the city for the benefit of the local economy, not to generate big profits. At the most recent bargaining round in September 2019, the RMTU successfully negotiated a deal and assured all staff received the living wage as minimum. In March 2020, New Zealand went into lockdown as a response to COVID-19, and the borders were effectively closed, the international tourist trade dried up overnight. In order to buy time, the business applied for the government wage subsidy, and RMTU members agreed to a 20% pay cut to ensure they remain on the payroll while at home in the lockdown. <laughs> By April, with no sign that international tourism was coming back anytime soon, DCHL became the sole shareholder. A proposal was put to Dunedin City Council, DCHL and the Board of Dunedin Railways recommending the closure of the business and the sale of its assets. This was rejected by the council, who took up an option to mothball the rolling stock and other assets, and make all but a few of the staff redundant. The proposed mothballing and redundancies was very poorly handled by management. Members learned of their fate via the media, before being told by their employer. RMTU immediately launched a campaign to keep Dunedin Railways rolling.
This was done in very difficult circumstances. At the time the whole country was in level 4 lockdown, with extensive restrictions on travel and meetings. Our objectives were to save jobs and the rolling stock and track. We also wanted to support our members and build organisation amongst them. Finally, as a campaigning union, the RNTU wanted to send a message to other employers that if they try to attack our members' livelihoods, we will fight long and hard to stop that. Our social media campaign was launched with an online petition and dedicated Facebook page administered by delegates. This quickly gained thousands of signatures and generated a stream of letters to local newspapers. A poster campaign appeared on the streets of Dunedin that generated more public support and media coverage. This was backed up with targeted newspaper advertisements. Otago Rail Branch Secretary and Kiwi Rail Locomotive Engineer Dave Kearns used the media skills he had acquired as an official of the former Hillside Branch and fronted up to the radio, newspaper and TV journalists. Dunedin's Mayor, City Councillors and local MPs were targeted for lobbying. This was successful in securing council endorsement for the goals of saving the jobs and the rolling stock. We also proposed that a trial of commuter passenger rail be undertaken and the business be reconfigured for the domestic tourist market. There was an overwhelming public and it appeared political backing for the RNTU. At this point we encountered the bizarre situation whereby elected councillors could not, under neoliberal local government legislation, instruct the boards of council-owned businesses to stop the mothballing. By design, council-owned businesses are run by boards. Although they are appointed by council, these boards are not subject to instruction by elected representatives of the people. This so-called freedom from political interference means unelected bureaucrats are essentially unaccountable at the point they are making decisions on behalf of the shareholder. A bid to trial commuter rail services was quashed. There was no attempt to reconfigure the business for the domestic tourist market. Dunedin Railways did not even apply for an extension of the wage subsidy or targeted funding for the tourist industry. There was no application to the Provincial Growth Fund. Despite endorsing the goals of our campaign, Dunedin City Council did not step in and halt the mothballing and redundancies. Dunedin Railways Limited pressed ahead with its crackpot mothballing scheme and more than 50 workers lost their jobs at a time when the government was handing out over $10 million to a local bungee jumping outfit as part of the $400 million tourism sector recovery package. Public outrage grew and as we went into level 2 lockdown a very successful protest was mounted at Dunedin City Council that achieved its goal of creating more positive publicity as RNTU members demonstrated they were both safety conscious and passionate about saving the railway. On 30th of June, the day the redundancy notices came into effect, our members took the message to the neighbourhood of Dunedin Railways Board Chair Kevin Winders, incidentally the CEO of Port Otago, and delivered leaflets to a suburb pointing out the travesty that was happening under his watch. This is a tactic the RNTU has employed in other disputes, and it never fails to evoke cries of foul play from the bosses. The fact is that the so-called ruling elite spends a great deal of time and effort and money insulating itself from the unpleasantness caused by its actions, living, shopping and playing in exclusive suburbs away from the economic and social impact of unemployment and in-work poverty. The leafletting tactic is a mild and peaceful way of reminding the ruling class that they are socially accountable. Our members at Dunedin Railways received tremendous support from their local branch, the wider union and 
other union members in Otago and beyond, and the public. We still have two members employed by the company, and our collective agreement remains in place. The situation now is that DCHL has invited and received expressions of interest for proposals from 15 parties around using the assets of Dunedin Railways. A reference group is charged with recommending next steps by October. The RMTU is seeking a place on that group. The RMTU is working hard behind the scenes to keep Dunedin Rail rolling. In the words of the late Bob Crow, former General Secretary of our comrade British Union, the RMT, If you fight, you may not win. If you don't fight, you will lose. The RMTU and former Dunedin Railways workers may not have won yet, but we're still fighting, and we might just win one day soon. <laughs>